On the evening of April 5th, 1994, John Prophet stopped by my home for one of our weekly visits. However, this visit almost never happened because, of all things, snow. Out of consideration for John, I called him earlier to ask if he didn't mind postponing our get-together for another night since it really was snowing pretty bad out, even though it was April. John insisted that he would be just fine in his four-wheel drive Jeep Cherokee. He appreciated my concern, but he had something he really wanted to show me, and I had a feeling I knew what it was. When John arrived, he dusted off his boots and I took his hat and coat while handing him a cup of coffee. After we settled into my kitchen, he handed me a wrinkled brown paper bag. In it were John's 16 millimeter railroad movies, his masterpieces, in a paper bag that looked like it once held his lunch. We sat at my kitchen table for two hours, talking about the films and what I could expect to see on some of the reels. We also talked about Jim Heron and how he used many of John's films for his rail fan videos like Pennsylvania Glory and Reflections of the New York Central. He also told me about a guy who borrowed one of his film reels for a project and never gave the film back. And at that moment, I couldn't determine if John told me about this guy as a precautionary tale, but it made me realize how important John's archives were and how incredibly valuable his photos, movies, and sound recordings could be. There's nothing worse than a content producer who obtains archival materials on trust, and then he sees that as an opportunity to betray that trust once an unreasonable amount of time passes. I had borrowed a 16mm Bell & Howell projector from work in order to copy some films from another gentleman who, like John, was a dedicated rail fan, and I had mentioned this fact to John some weeks prior. While I didn't specifically ask John to see his films and make copies, I did ask him many questions about the films I had seen in Jim Heron's Railfan videotapes. Lucky for me, John took the fact that I had a projector as a hint. When we moved our fellowship into the living room, I set up the projector while John selected which films he wanted to watch and in the order he wanted to see them. As the projector started moving, right away we ran into problems. The films contained numerous splices, and some were coming apart as they were being threaded through the projector. Even though the projector was being very gentle with the films, a damaged splice going by makes an awful racket. You have no choice but to assume that something destructive is happening to the film. So John was very nervous about this happening, but to be fair, he expected as much due to the film's age and the age of the splicing tape he used. However, he was confident I'd be able to splice the films together so we could spend the rest of the evening watching them while John explained to me everything we were seeing. There could be no better narrator. I'd like to point out that I was so excited to see these films that I often sounded like I was gushing, like a child meeting Santa Claus. To be honest, I was. Naturally, it was hard for me to get a word in edgewise due to John's enthusiasm over the subject matter in the films, but his photographic memory really shined as he described with incredible detail each second of film we were watching. It seemed like he shot the footage yesterday. One final note I'd like to make is this. I clearly remember John's visit on that snowy evening of April 5th, 1994. What I had no recollection of was the fact that I recorded our entire visit. Back in those days, I often used a hi-fi stereo VCR to make audio recordings. Even at the super slow speed, which gave me six hours of recording time, the audio quality was pretty good. Obviously, I placed a microphone somewhere in the living room and captured everything that was said between John and I. Sometimes I would ask questions that I already knew the answer to, or I'd make a statement that seemed like utter nonsense. But my main reason for doing this was to get John to open up and tell me everything about what we were seeing in his films. He didn't disappoint. I'll apologize in advance for my over-enthusiasm, which really comes across at times. I stumbled on this VHS tape by accident because I was looking for another tape of something totally unrelated. It wasn't in a cardboard sleeve, and there was only a yellow post-it note on the tape that said, John Prophet talking about his 16mm movies, audio only. It's a good thing I made the recording in super long play mode. The tape only had a few minutes left on it before it ran completely out. 
That's how long John stayed that night. And in listening to our conversation back, the fellowship was wonderful. Just two friends enjoying some home movies of trains. After listening to the recording of my visit with John as he talked about them, I figured there would be no better narrator for John's films than John himself. There we go. John did. Oh, there's, there's Ebenezer Station. station. There. Oh, That's it. see, yeah. Union Road was a grade crossing just beyond right. the station there. They hadn't built that bridge yet. That's did a freight with an M1 going out, BNY 14. It used to follow 570. M1A, actually. Did Heron include the scene in its entirety? Oh, I, I'm not sure. Yeah. I'll look past too and check them over. Yeah. Of course, he added in some other stuff from other people, too, you know, mm -hmm. some good mm -hmm. stuff. There's an H9. That's right in front of the, right passing the Ebenezer uh, station. So you're standing on the platform of the station? Well, right about, probably, maybe in the same, I don't know what it was just. That light tower is still there. Oh, yeah. It sure is. This is farther out, beyond Ebenezer. It's beyond the end of the, uh, the yard, beyond the south end of the yard. These are all 1936 here. I think after this big cloud of black smoke comes a streamlined K4 that, that was on display in Buffalo for one day. Yeah. Yeah, there it is. I remember asking you about the K4 too. Yeah. Do they ever that, streamline them? There was only one with that style of streamlining, the first one, and there were four others done later with a different style. Where was that on display? At the central terminal on that track along, um, well, what used to be Lindbergh Drive. Oh, it's really? A, yeah, track out next to the street. That's going through um, Elma. The Elma station is just out of sight over to the left. That's right on the grade, too, right? Blasting up a... And this is the freight train that followed it every day, working hard uphill. That's at Elma. Mm. Is Elma Station still there? I don't think so. I think yeah. it's Didn't you say it was Jameson Road or something like that? That was the next place beyond Elma, was Jameson Road. Yeah. Yeah. There was a station there, too. Ooh, look at this. Wow. Of course, it was a long train. <clears throat> that had to be hard on the caboose. <laughs> They had to have strong steel underframes. Two L1s. Usually there were at least one of them would be I1, sometimes two I1. That train is headed to Rochester, Doodlebug. But that's on the double track main line between the Olean and Hinsdale, where they mm. ran up for seven miles and they turned off in Hinsdale. Were these in Pennsylvania Glory? I don't remember these. I don't think he used these scenes because they probably weren't of sufficient interest. There isn't even a view of the outside of the Doodlebug. I still oh, really? But not to, that's part of the Rochester Bridge. This was in the early spring. In fact, this was March 31st. That's why it looks like winter time. I mean, the trees are all... Oh, up there, yeah. This was the last year they ran a passenger train. Now, this is going through Letchworth Park, near where some of those pictures I took on that... Uh, really? ...steam trip were. Mm -hmm. this, only, this is 1937. So this is the Rochester Bridge? Rochester Bridge, yeah. The river is over the gorge. is just out of sight over to the left. Do you get a <laughs> shot going underneath Portage? I did the next day coming back, you could just faintly see the bridge. I didn't try to aim. I had the camera sitting on top of a controller box. Mm. It was alongside the engineers. I can't Please, believe how stable it, steady, it is. That's why it's stable. Yeah. You can see the car rocking slightly. There, there's a, there's the gorge. You can't really yeah. see much. It's 500 feet deep, but that's all we could see without pointing the camera down. Oh. I kept the camera sitting on this box so that it wouldn't jiggle in my hands. And you see, it doesn't jiggle. You can just see a gentle rocking. Yeah, just ever well, so slightly. Just the car rocking slightly, but the yeah. camera was just like it was anchored to the car body, you know, because it was sitting on a flat steel box that was bolted to the wall of the car in the front, uh, alongside the engine. And of course, seat. what, every 30 seconds you'd have to stop and re-crank it? Yeah, well, I could re-crank it, yes. Yeah, but I could keep it sitting right where it is and just re-crank it real fast, you know, and then oh, really? shooting picture. Oh, I don't have to pick it up to re-crank it. See, I had it sitting on a solid steel 
support, so it was great. You didn't have to move the camera at all. What would happen if you held it in place and tried cranking it as it was winding? Because you've been able to do that as it was well, winding I think down. You could. Yeah, yeah, you could if the camera was on a solid. If it was steady base, enough, sure. I couldn't hold it in my hand and do it. Yeah, no, no, no. Oh yeah, you could keep the turning the winding crank out while the camera was running if you held down. In fact, you didn't even have to. If you wanted to take continuous movies, you could. Um, if you push the, uh, the the lever down all the way down, it would lock in position. Then you had to push it back up to oh. stop the camera. So you could push that down. There's the portage bridge. It's all you about. Oh, all you see. Oh seeing. yeah. This is going back south the next day, April first, thirty seven. There's oh, a little bit of the bridge. Oh, look at that! Oh, see, there was God. snow. There was snow down in here because it was shady right along here. I can't believe Herod didn't want to use these. <laughs> These are yeah, stunning. See, Look I don't at know this. If you've seen oh. any of the upper the upper falls are right under that bridge. Oh. This is back to Ebenezer again in 37. <laughs> in the summer of 37. That was train. great. I wish I had more of that. No, that was great. Color. But that train came off in July of that year, 37. And I made a whole round trip from Olean to Rochester back to Olean the next day with an engineer, a friend of mine. That stayed overnight in the bunkhouse at the Rochester engine house. Oh. <laughs> <coughs> That's right in Buffalo, right near Fil Fillmore Avenue Bridge. The train is just coming that, off the of New That York building looks like they're demolishing it. Are they demolishing that building? I don't know. I haven't been down that in that neighborhood in years. These look like these look so much sharper than than the video print. Hmm. They really do. And that's out alongside the Ebenezer Yard, out toward the south end of it. This is an also in 37. Mm -hmm. Oops. The first color shot. Refocus. It's out here, it means you're somewhere. That's the first shot in color that I ever took. That's in 37. The first year they had any good color film. Color film. 30, the Kodachrome film was introduced in 36, but it was no good at all. It just faded out. Turned pink sure. and then faded to nothing. But this is 37, and that hasn't changed a bit. No, it years. hasn't. That's beautiful. It's not the best. They improved it again in 39, but it isn't bad, though. It's, a, it's got a, a bit, slight pink tinge to yeah. it, but that's something that but can't if be you're corrected. Shooting, the trains are pretty good. If you're shooting uh, just general scenes, the greens didn't show up as well. The greens right. are a little more bluish. And in 39, they really improved it. Which alongside the Ebenezer. What is that, a crossing shanty, that little building in the center there? I'm not sure. No, it's some kind of a tool house or something. A crossing shanty was beyond that. And here's the M1 coming out on the, on the freight. Is that BNY-14? BNY-14, yeah. That yep. was the number of the freight that used to leave Buffalo right after the passenger train, after 570. Or well, within a half hour after, usually. Are you holding the camera? Do you have them yeah, on no, a tripod? No, I never used a tripod. In. Now, was it... Was it your own personal choice not to shoot the entire trainers because you the trains were so you long you, you couldn't, couldn't shoot the train? You the camera would only run for 25 seconds. Sure, sure. There's no way you could shoot the whole train. I rarely could even, unless a passenger train was going at a pretty good speed, you couldn't get a whole passenger train. That's an emporium on the turntable. <coughs> That's in 1938. Back when the K4s look good. Is that working all right? Yeah, it's just the splices going by, but I'd rather... Yeah, there are a lot of splices in this. I'd rather be here to grab it just in case, mm -hmm. rather than have it go through. But no, it's going through just fine. These yeah. Bell and Howell projectors are pretty gentle, though. Oh, that's a Bell and Howell. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I haven't seen any modern projectors. I don't really know much about them or how they work. And mine is an old Kodak. They're very gentle on the film. I've had it for many years. Huh? I got that one from Channel 17. Mm. It's in 38. See, you can see it's got a good. slight pink tinge to it, <coughs> hmm. but it still looks great. Look at that. Yeah. The engine was recently painted. Now, this, this is, is where? BNY, this Emporium. Emporium, right. Emporium. And that's BNY-14 coming, following the passenger train at a uh, half hour behind. I know I've asked you this a million times, but I can't remember. Is there anything to see in Emporium anymore? I don't think there's much of anything now. Yeah. The engine house has been gone for years. I guess the station was torn down long ago. I don't think there are any tracks in the yard there. Probably two or three tracks, maybe. I don't know. For all we know, it's probably there. condominiums now. They don't operate any trains in and out of there, I guess, unless it's just a local, maybe. Oh, the end of Emporium and back. And here's the two uh, 
pusher engines that uncoupled at Keating Summit and followed the train down. Two high ones. Back when they looked good. No messed up headlights and generators back in those days. No. The engineers all wore white caps on the fence. You notice everyone when you see there got that. They didn't wear the seer slacker, huh? The white white and blue stripe? No, plain white. Why is that? I don't know. Engineers have sort of a trademark of Pensy Engineers. There's T4 number 43. That was running between Emporium and Erie then, at that time. Buffalo Harrisburg train had a connection to and from Erie and it terminated in Emporium. And that's 571 coming in toward, toward Buffalo. And there's some more black and white that I shot. This is from the new Union Road Bridge at Ebenezer. Oh, they just put the bridge in, huh? Yeah. Yeah, this was in, thir I think this was 37. These are not in exact order because I spliced this in later. I think it's 37 or whenever they completed that bridge. It was that same year. And I walked up on the bridge and... What was the reason they put the Union Road Bridge in, besides the obvious? Because traffic well, the was traffic increasing was getting so heavy Road? on Union Road. Sure. Yes. Sure. Of course, they had to have a watchman there day and night just right. to stop traffic. This is an arcade. This is 571 with an M1 that day headed toward Buffalo. And we've been riding the arcade in Attica, so we... Took a break and shot the Pensy. Yeah. Oh, that's this, nice. I think this was the day we drove down there. We were shooting pictures. It wasn't the day we rode it. This is 570, another day coming into arcade at a different time. We obviously weren't riding the train because we were already in arcade. I think I was there, I don't know whether anyone, any other rail fans were with me or not, but we were at the station to see the train come through and it just makes a very brief stop. Our cave was a flag stop. So it only stopped if somebody signaled somebody to, to get on or off. Right. Yeah, it barely came to a stop and then it started up again right away. Look at those Pullman cars. Car. Dining, dining car. And then of course yeah. our two Pullman cars is a pirate car for uh, Washington and a pirate car for Philadelphia. They ran prior cars to both places. Oil City, and there's the only known color moving picture of an E3 Atlantic. My favorite engine of all types. I like them even better than the big E6s. Why is that? Because well, they're they more tiny? grace, more graceful, and more beautiful lines than the fat bordered E6. Yeah, look at that. I've got a lot of black and white still pictures of that. But no, I didn't have a color slide camera. Oh, look that at day. that. That's an old timer, John. Well, it was built in 1908. There were some of them older than that. Is that was that engine preserved? No, there's one something like it was preserved in Strasbourg. It's an older engine. That seven one they numbered 7002. This is in Lock Haven, and that's 571 headed toward Buffalo. We were going to Altoona on this trip. This is 1940. So you took these when you were on, a, on an excursion, right? Yeah, well, this picture is on an excursion. Right. We, were, we had a group of about 27 or 28 people that went uh, on a group rate, went, rode regular trains, went to Altoona, and went, conducted a tour through the shops, and then we rode up to um, Crescent, ride right around the Horseshoe Curve through Glitz and Tunnels, and came back again. We had that inspection car one way. That's that car standing on the main track there. Right. right. Next to us, an open I, end inspection car. I remember these. There's a DD1. Side rod and gearless electric on the Long Island. That's passing the New York World's Fair in 1939. Mm. They used them on train. There's the S1. There's the, uh, yeah, yeah. The famous S1 working on a treadmill. Letter to American Railroad for those first two years, you know, it was at the fair. Because the, uh, the other railroads contributed towards building this display. That's why they had that name. Oh, on. really? Yeah. Pensiel built and owned the engine, but the, all the other railroads in the U.S. contributed toward that. This is the biggest exhibit of its kind, something like that. And that engine was fired up, you know, for the entire duration of the fair, both years. Was it really? Yeah. Yeah, they had a fire going. And this is back just uh, south of Ebenezer. The uh, freight train, BNY-14. This is in 1940. With a pusher? Yeah. Wouldn't the guys that were in the in the caboose get a little nervous with this engine behind oh, them? I understand they did sometimes, especially when they're pushing on places where there are a lot of sharp curves. Oh, like pushing from Altoona to Galitzin on the main line. I, oh, sure. I heard people say that they, some of the crews would be scared to stay in the cabin <laughs> car. They would get out and um, 
go out and ride in one of the pusher engines and stand up in the in the cab. Uh, Rather than ride the caboose. Rather than ride in there because they say the floor used to creak even though it was steel. No, those were steel and they had a concrete floor. They had a steel bottom, you know, and then they had a concrete floor laid out like they did in the passenger car. And it would still creak. And they would still creak and the floors would get cracked, you know, from just a slight oh. give and twisting action in the steel framework and steel body of the, and they'd creak and groan. I never rode in one with a push around, but some it was scary. They wouldn't even stay in them. Can't you say I blame Two of those I ones pushing. And that's almost 200,000 pounds push on that. No thanks. Yeah. Now that's in Johnstown. That's on that famous... That's where the flood bridge. was. That's, what, that's, where the, that's the bridge that was aired in the 1889 Johnstown flood and all the buildings and houses all piled up against that bridge. And really? It caused a, and then it caught fire. Yeah, that was an I-1 on that. I'd forgotten it started out with that scene. This is in York, Pennsylvania, K K4 on a train from uh, Harrisburg to Baltimore. And that's in Baltimore. Oh, that's nice. Look at that. That was when they were running uh, the diesels that laid over in Harrisburg all day from the night trains. Uh -huh. They used to make trips to Baltimore and back. I'm they surprised you took a running. movie of a diesel. <laughs> I just thought it was something unusual back then. They were rare then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no well, movies. that's true. I got a few movies later on the Horseshoe Curve, and here's the doodle bugs that when they used to run the locals from Baltimore to uh, Parkton, which was on the line to Harrisburg. Look at those switch lights. Commuter trains. Oh. Hmm. This is right near the Baltimore station. Now, were you there visiting the Kessels? Yeah, this was back when Kessel lived there, yeah. Yeah. 1947-48, along in there. Now, this is in Titusville. This is a, tra a train from uh, Cory to Oil City. And they rode it to Titusville and got off there, a friend and I. Oh, it was a friend who used to work at Bayview Tower. We rode it because we would made arrangement with the conductor on the New York Central to ride the New York Central caboose on their run from Titusville to Dunkirk. Uh huh. So we had to lay over several hours. And this is in Englewood, Chicago, 1948. Look at that diesel pulling out of the back. Look mm -hmm. at that. There's a K4 coming into toward Chicago from somewhere. I don't know whether that's from Columbus or from, from Pittsburgh. And this color. is in 48. Is where they had some streamlined cars in. The New York Central is just over on the other side. And there's a round end observation car. In one of these scenes, you'll see a New York Central diesel coming east. Now, there's see, a there's diesel. a New York yeah. Central. There's a Pennsylvania diesel. Is that that Tuscan uh, or that uh, no, Brunswick Brun Green? The rail fans call it Brunswick Green. It looks they, black to me. <laughs> it looks black to me. That's <laughs> the same color they painted the steam engines. Those yep. are. The, the Pennsylvania call it locomotive dark green. That's what they call it. But the rail fans call it Brunswick green. I don't know where they But it green. looks black to me. <laughs> yeah, it sure does. Now yeah, that's the Broadway Limited. You yeah. See where there's oh, the look at that. Yeah, yeah that's the, wow. That's the two-tone paint job when they had the maroon uh, window panel. Yeah. That was, was that sign paint. neon? No. Or was it just fluorescent no. paint? It looked like it was glowing. No, that sign was just was uh, colored on, on glass or behind glass. Oh, boy. Look, look, look at this. Right wow. There's a T1 coming in. That's on a train, I believe, from, <coughs> from Pittsburgh. Just a day, some daytime train, but this was in the afternoon. That one, I didn't bother to get the head end. It was a, a diesel, and it probably was something worth getting. I think it was Baldwin diesels. Oh, John. I hated the things back in those days. I, Even though they were such a rarity, they were so yeah. new? Yeah, yeah. Well, you well, got, got one. There's a Baldwin. One. There's a Baldwin. Sharp nosed passenger diesel. I think that other one that I've just missed, it's seeing the, I think that was an Alco, an Alco PA passenger diesel. What's that? that? What's well, that's one of those Rock Island cars. Yeah. It was one of those through cars to, um, from New York to uh, Los Angeles. Oh, There's look at this, the Broadway or the 20th. No, I think that was a Commodore Vanderbilt or something. The, the Broadway and the uh, 20th century were not due at the same time like they had been at one time. Oh, really? Ago. Okay. They were due about a half hour apart. 10 minutes or so. I think that was a Commodore Vanderbilt. And this one, I don't know if this is a Broadway or not. I have to see. That other one wasn't, no. And this is back east again. This is east of the Galitzin Tunnels. A place called Bennington Curve. Mm. On the grade went down toward Altoona, toward the Horseshoe Curve. Everywhere west. Mm. That's a little cute. different. And this is at Mapleton uh, track pans on the Pensy near, near Mount Union. One of those you saw in those scenes before. 
Oh, yeah. This is one time I visited the spot in the uh, movie. I wish I could have gotten a movie shot, but I couldn't run both cameras. There was a, a T1 on a passenger train came west scooping water, and I got a good black and white still of that. Oh, but, boy. Uh, there was nobody to run the movie camera. I would have liked to have a movie shot of it. This is in Tyrone, a train going up the Bald Eagle branch. To, uh, to With the diesel, Eagle. look at that. Yeah, those are brand new diesels being delivered up to uh, Clearfield or somewhere, in the Clearfield branch. Yeah, Why did they put a boxcar between them? Do you I know? I don't know what the reason was. No, I don't know. They had a s steep grade going up north from Tyrone, but they used uh, pushers on up that grade. There it is going up through town. I'm down by at the main line by the station. Looks just like a model, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Just like a model. And that's on the main line of train going east. This is stations over between the two uh, passenger tracks, which are the middle tracks through mm -hmm. there. And there's a train coming off the branch line onto the main line at Tyrone. Coming off that Bald Eagle branch? Off the Bald Eagle branch, yeah. Hey, quite a bit of traffic on that line. There's an M1 and a caboose on that. It was turning around on the Y. There's a Y. The station sat right in the middle of a Y there. Yeah. And this is up in that first place north of on the Bald Eagle Branch, north of Tyrone, the one of those freight set it up with an I-1. And this is a... There were some rail fans along. We were on an automobile tr trip chasing trains looking for steam back in the 1950s. And this one will have an I-1 pusher on the rear. It's wheel slipping. Yeah. Yeah, look at it. <laughs> yeah, look at that. It's yeah, it was slipping when that big cloud of black smoke was roaring out of there. Yeah, there, it's slipping again there, too. No it's sound. obviously pushing too hard. No sound. Now, this is at the west end of the Rockville Bridge, around 1956, somewhere around there. The M1, coming out of Harrisburg instead of out of Enola. And there's a train, I think down here you'll see a train coming out of Enola too, you'll see it in one of these scenes here. Yeah, see there's one yeah. coming out of Enola and that other one's coming out of Harrisburg. And they go through that tunnel and come up inside the, now that's over in New Jersey, in Spring Lake, New Jersey, on the New York and Long Branch. The train's between the <coughs> New York and uh, Bayhead Junction. They ran the K-4s from uh, South Amboy to Bayhead Junction. Three cars Computer plus trains. luggage. Yeah. And here's the D-16. 1223 on the Strasburg during some of the years when that was running. 1962, I guess it is, or 60-something. Well, whatever the last year was on the label on there. This is at the Strasburg station where they run the engine around the, around the train to the other end of the train. Just like most of these tourist railroads, the engines run backwards in one direction because they don't have any place to turn. Turn it, sure. Have, have you ever been to Strasburg? No, before? never. Well, that's a great place. That museum is great, too. That's wonderful. That's a friend I'm, of mine had been there. I got ninety per 99% of the Pensy equipment and stuff is there. That museum covers all railroads in Pennsylvania, but it's 90% Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, Railroad. sure. Yeah. Yeah, it was great to see one of these engines in operation again. These used to run every day through my hometown. I lived in Mount Morris. They were really? The Rochester Branch, yeah. To see them all every day. Saw nothing of them, they were a dime a dozen back in the 1920s and into the early 30s. I had a cab ride in that engine on the Strasburg one time. Really? I arranged a cab ride, yeah, that was great. Did you take uh, any pictures, any movies? I didn't take any movies from the, in the cab, no. I made sound recordings, though. I got a good sound recording from the baggage compartment of the first car one day. Excellent. Oh, boy. It's still on wire, huh? No, that, do, that was done on tape, on the oh, uh, first tape recorder, a oh. uh, reel-to-reel tape recorder. And I want to copy that over on a cassette. Sure, I'll be able to do that for you. I can take I it to several, work and do I it. I have several uh, stuff. You see, for several years, I had, uh, I guess it was before they invented cassette, I had a reel-to-reel -reel, uh, tape recorder. And an I, Ampex? Uh, an old Ampex? No, it's an old uh, WebCore. Ah, yep. The web, WebCore. I, now that's looking out of the gondola car. Oh, there's a CG1. There's a yeah. one going through double header on the freight, going through a Lemon Place where they Strasburg. And there's the D16 turning around. They use what used to be the east eastbound uh, freight track of the Pennsy Main Line to uh, run around the train. 
The train was in on the siding. This is on Heron's film. Oh, I, rem yeah. I remember this. Mm, yeah. John, do you have those reel-to-reels handy? Do you know where they are? I know where most of them are. I because I got a reel-to-reel -reel recorder right here. We could do it right here in the living room. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, bring them by sometime. Done. We'll make it even out of it. I would have to take my reel-to-reel -reel recorder to get something done over there. I yeah, well, I got one right there. Yeah, There's great, mine. Great. I was going to ask you about that sometime. Yeah, I there, you'd have a there it is. It's right mm -hmm. there. Yeah, well, that's it's great. all. It's, it's it's a Sony. It's been serviced yeah, and everything. See, uh, see these D16s are great. Yeah, see, there's a baggage compartment in that first car. Yeah. And, I had, and it had a big, like a wooden counter in the one corner of the baggage compartment. I set the recorder on that, and uh, I got some beautiful sounds. We made a real fast run, too. The guy that later was this superintendent of motive power in the Strasbourg it used to be a, the engineer who ran the engine. Now, he really worked at E16. Does it's it still, does it still run that. in Strasbourg? No. No, they didn't renew their contract because it needed new flues and they didn't want to spend the money on an engine they didn't own. So it went back to the museum across the road. And it's been there ever since. Yeah, oh, so it's not boy. going to run again. That other engine they use, you know, that Atlantic type, that 70 old Right, flu, yeah. They were using that for a couple of years and um, some, I guess it's expired or something. I don't know what, anyway, they returned that. So they don't use any Pensy engine anymore now. Did you put this leader here, or did Heron do that? No, he, he did that. I just had short uh, leaders that were... That's quite, great stuff. White ones. He had to put those on, I guess, to do the copy work. But I just had the short leaders that came with the, on the film when we come back from processing yeah. and stuff. It was just barely long enough to thread it through uh, the projectors. Nice leaving at the Broad Street Station in Philadelphia. Okay, that, let, that, me, let me stop, because I, I wanted a cup of tea, and it just, it just oh. got done. Well, John, that reminds me. The Broad Street Station was Pensy's. Oh yes, yeah, only railroad that used it. Yeah. And the 30th Street Station was the Central's. Oh no! Central? Oh no! 100 percent Pensy. There was no New York Central anywhere around Philadelphia. There wasn't any New York Central within uh, 90 miles of Philadelphia. As close as it got was New York City. Okay, so the 30th Street Station that Amtrak uses now, that was a Pensy Station. That was 100 percent Pensy. That was a Pensy no Station. No other railroad used it. Okay. Broad Street Station was 100 percent Pensy. And the Broad Street, what they call the Broad Street Suburban Station, right next to the old Broad Street Station, that was 100% Pensy. You could only buy MU trains. Well, the Pensy had three big passenger stations all within a mile. I saw the GG1 at the head of that engine. That was real now, nice. Did you get the beginning of it? That's, yep. uh, that's over, Overbrook. It's the first station west of Philadelphia. Now, See, this is an, um, were you on a vacation or on an excursion, or how were you able to do this? No, oh, we arranged it through the passenger agent in, in Buffalo. We arranged to have this um, observation car. It's an old former um, ex Pullman observation pirate car, and the railroad bought 20 of them during the war mm -hmm. to use for um, troop cars. They put uh, wooden benches in them, you see the 3-2 three, uh, three, seating. Right. And. Um, they used them on troop trains. They still had the open observation platform. So the NRHS made the see, arrangement to have this car put on, or you did? You know, well, I did, and um, a friend who was also a member of the NRHS, he was a trip chairman at that time, he, he went along with me too, and we arranged it through the Pensy's uh, local uh, passenger agents oh, wow. in, in Buffalo. And they went, they okayed it. We told them to take moving pictures of uh, the scenery on the on the railroad, and they went along with a hundred percent of the. Oh, idea. that's great! They never even asked for a copy of the film. But really? Too, of course, this is in the morning, shooting into the sun, and it's hazy, very hot, right. hazy day in July of uh, 1946. And uh, some of the <coughs> scenes are not too good. There's where the uh, freight cut off from Trenton to Enola crosses the main line. You see a lot of pictures of that bridge. It's still yeah. There. There's a, there's a place called Whitford. If you ever notice that name on it. Are you under electric that. power right now? Oh, yes. You're probably being pulled yeah, by a GG1, right? GG1, yeah. Right. And there's the main track coaling station at Thorndale, which is quite long gone. Now, where were you going on this trip? To Pittsburgh. Philadelphia, Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. To Pittsburgh. Okay. Two, so days, you two days later, so we arranged to come back there with water pans on the freight tracks only. They used to be on the two outside tracks, which are the passenger tracks, and they mm -hmm. were removed after electrification. That's a place where, called Atlin. Where did the GG1 cut off and you get onto steam power? At Harrisburg. Her I was going to say the Harrisburg. The, that's the end of the wires. I was going to say yeah. Harrisburg, yeah. It still is the end of the it wires. It still is, yeah. yeah. They never electrified beyond that. So when we were in Harrisburg a couple of years ago, I wish to God I could have checked out the museum that's there. Mm. But I didn't have any time. And that's a place called Gap. 
you see pictures taken there sometimes. And, uh, watch these in front of it. That's the station in Lancaster. One of the few stations west of Philadelphia that has high platforms. Allen and Johnstown. Has. This might seem really strange, but did the Amish ride the train a lot? I don't know. Because don't there was such a did. large Amish population uh, yeah, in Lancaster all, all County. All I, I don't think, I never saw them very much. They used to ride a train some, I know, years ago when there were a lot of people riding trains. I used to see them in there. You can tell by the way they're dressed. Well, sure, not a, yeah. Not an awful lot, though. They didn't seem to do much traveling. Yeah. They stayed right in their area. In and their the sack, traveling yeah. They did with, uh, with horse and buggy, and they never seemed to. They did ride trains, though, if they did travel anywhere that was too far to go by horse. Right. But not an awful lot, considering how many of them there were, were and still are around there. Is that the dust you're talking about? Yeah, well, it was a hazy day, too, mm -hmm. but the dust is um, when we get on the west, where there was a lot of soot, west of Harrisburg, where the roadbed would get a lot dirtier. Yeah, that's, that's what was the running time of this camera? Was it still about 25 seconds, about, 30 seconds? About 20, 25 seconds or so. Mm -hmm. I timed it one time, or at least once, see how long it would run. This is coming into Harrisburg. Heron didn't use all of this, did he? I think he only used the so, stuff around yeah. Horseshoe Curve. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Because a lot of this wouldn't be worth... Those signals are still around GJ. There's hmm. still one of those signals. You mean those dwarf signals? Those little dwarfs, those right around. Oh, yeah. Yep, there's this is, one. This is leaving uh, Harrisburg Station, which still has those train sheds there. Does it really? Yeah. So they left the train. In fact, they overhauled it and remodeled it, fixed it all up a few years ago. We started it. It had been neglected quite badly. And this is some five miles west of Harrisburg. It's coming out of the Rockville Bridge. The line to Buffalo is, goes off there to the uh, left. This is the famous Rockville Bridge. You don't see much of the bridge from a train, of course. Mm -hmm. That's crossing the bridge, and of course there are no more wires over here. The wires no, they're here gone. In Harrisburg. What what's pulling you? A K4, K4 probably, right? K4, yeah. yeah. The two right-hand tracks here are the passenger tracks, and the two left ones are freight. That's why we're on. A, appears to be a, a wrong track, but it isn't. It's the westbound passenger track. Mm. See, it's hazy off in the distance. The visibility was very poor. It was hot, hazy weather. Hot, yeah. See that white stuff over there that looks like fog? That isn't That's from smoke, low. really. That's a, a haze. Yeah. There's just a little from the, uh, smoke from the engine. Not too much. A little bit. You see how sort of dusty it is. Yeah. How fast were you going here? Oh, no, here. I don't know. I think. Well, maybe Probably 30, 40 miles an hour. More than that, yeah. I think so. You see all the dust there? How dusty that is in there? Yeah. yeah. Most of that is not smoke from the engine. You see the smoke coming. Overhead, the train. overhead, sure. Yeah. Was that track pans? Track pans, the four track. Yeah, I got pictures of all of all of them. Just every ones that we passed over and all I got. Because I knew where they were. And I wish I'd gotten some other shots too, some more of the uh, towers, the interlocking towers. How many rolls of film did it take you to shoot this this excursion here? Now you shot f um, five, and that was because it was bad weather. I took, shot four rolls going west. Mm -hmm. And then we run into some real bad weather before we between Johnstown and Pittsburgh. I didn't shoot anything in that last didn't shoot 40 anything miles. At night. We ran into a big thunderstorm. It was oh, dark yeah. And a rain yeah. Was you never in. shot at night, did you? No. Well, you couldn't. This kind of a scene at night, you, couldn't, you wouldn't get anything. Well, sure. But you see all that haze down there? That's dust from the roadbed. Oh, boy. Look at it, see? Oh, look at That's that. That's dust. Just the dust that the train is kicking up. Yeah, paper. Yeah. And it's all dust. See, it's sort of, this is a station stop, and here's a freight that overtakes us with an M1. And we overtake that again later after we get going. This was sort of a, a somewhat of a localist train. It made quite a few stops, mm -hmm. which was uh, just what we wanted. And it was the only kind of train they would put this car on anyway. Which was fine. That's at Mifflin. We made a lot, quite a few stops. But that, that I guess yeah, that's what make it so charming. The, coming to that famous Den Home coaling plant which is the largest one in the world. You we'll see that soon there. You can't see much of it. Look how dusty it is. That's got two tracks on top of it, the hopper cars, and the tracks go off on the other end. The empty cars go down. Oh, look at that. Times again. But look at the, now there's some smoke from the engine. From the engine, the right. Above. <coughs> the chances are he's scooping water, right? Yeah, yeah. There's the boiler house over to the left there. They used for heat, heating the water in the winter. John, do you think that the area, as it, do you think this area pretty much exists today in the same way? Are there still the same number of tracks? 
mostly two tracks now, three in some places, and there's hardly any four left. But it's still, but the road bed is still there, right? The, yeah. The oh yeah, there's always at least two tracks on it, and there's a lot of heavy freight traffic, a lot of traffic on it. There's that freight we overtook it that overtook us before. Look at it disappear in a cloud of dust there. So the route to Philadelphia to Pittsburgh is still pretty busy. Oh yeah, oh very busy. A lot of freight traffic on it. Mostly Conrail. Oh, that's Jack's narrow, isn't it? Yeah, all Conrails. War I deliberately got, oh, about every 40 miles. There was oh. a lot of stuff I didn't get in between because it was so dusty that I didn't even waste film trying to shoot yeah. pictures. But the scenery, it was so du dusty. I can't believe how stable it is. Well, that's, that's beautiful. Awesome. Yeah, well, you see, this was the only time I ever used a tripod. You couldn't hold, hand hold it. No, no, around. no. There's a Spruce Creek tunnel, or two tunnels side by side. There's the other one over in there. There's a, uh, were you the principal operator? Point. Did anybody else operate the camera just to give you a break? No, no, I, no one else had ever touched a movie camera. I was, a, yeah. I was on that trip. There were several other rail fans went along, mm -hmm. including old Russ Shapley, who organized the regional rail fan group in Buffalo. He was on it for one way, or westbound. This is this place where there was never more than three tracks there, from uh, Spruce Creek to... Look at those beautiful towers. To uh, Tyrone. Yeah, and this is Tyrone. Just everything is gone. The station is gone, and two two tracks through there instead of four. You know, and there's two more of those track pans around the passenger tracks only because it's close to Altoona, and the freight trains didn't need water. They changed engines, went in the yard and mm. changed engines. So there's just the two middle track. There's a westbound freight on that left-hand track, and the other track to the right is an eastbound freight. And this is coming into Altoona. And we stayed overnight in Altoona. And the next day we. Went up around the horseshoe curve. The next so you got station. off the train here? Yeah, well, they took our. They took your car? Well, not off. here, no. I was thinking of the other thing. We stayed overnight in Altoona went with that inspection car, 1940. No, this one we went on through to, to uh, Pittsburgh. Stayed in Pittsburgh. Oh, right, okay. okay. Yeah, the other, the other one where they had the um, that open end <coughs> inspection car out of Buffalo, that one we stayed overnight in Altoona. They took it off. This is. Yeah, he, there's an M1, a 2102, just making its test run out of coming out of the shops. They'd always make a test run up to Galitzin just to see if everything was working all right. Uh-huh. See how hazy it is? It's yeah. one, of the, one of the three reservoirs there in the middle of the horseshoe curve. Now, are you now, approaching the curve now? It, yes. Yeah, hmm. that, yeah, that's the, yeah, that's the curve there. We're just coming off of it. In close-up views, this doesn't look too bad, but off in the distance, it was so hazy you couldn't see much of anything. Yeah, this is the is that horseshoe the curve, way curve back there? over in there. I yeah. turned the camera yeah. up, yeah. and you can see that uh, oh, there it is. stone horseshoe right, sure. right in the middle. Of course, there was no engine up there on display. Yeah, on display, time. yeah. This was in 1946, and there was no engine until 52. Of course, there's a there's a monument there now in yeah. uh, the park. And a little switcher. Oh, that look was at a, those towers. That They're was so a new tower. beautiful. There never used to be a tower there. That was new during the they built that during the war in the 1940s. Now really? It's, now it's closed. Yeah. Is it still there? It's still there, but it's closed. It's a remote control now from mm -hmm. the dispatcher's office. Do you think the majority of these towers are still there on this line? Well, they, they, I don't know how many of the towers are still in. Uh, that one is yes, that was a new brick and stone concrete mm -hmm. tower, and they. But they've made them mostly, it's all the CTC system. Yeah, right, right, controlled right. Controlled by dispatchers on There's hardly any towers left, I understand. This I area know. seems pretty ex inaccessible to the to the rail fan who wanted to get to the tracks to photograph well, stuff. Is, is that you true? Know where you, if you know where certain dirt roads are, you can yeah. get to some places, but you have to know how to do it. Look now, at this that. This is all three tracks up there, you know. Blasted right? through... Tons and tons yeah. of rock. Oh, well, that's some scenic ride, and this is approaching the glitz and tunnels. The eastbound tracks are up high on that embankment, and these are the two westbound tracks below. Mm. That track coming in from the right there is an abandoned branch now, down to Holiday Bird, New Newport Each Branch, it was called. Here's the glitz and tunnel. On one of the two westbound tunnels. Yes, the two west, and this is the west end of them coming out of it. The two single track tunnels side by side. Those are the two westbound tracks. It's and that's still in use, right? Yep. Yeah, and then the eastbound tunnel is still in use. You know, there's an eastbound freight up on that higher level. At the eastbound tunnel is um, about 30 feet higher than the, than the westbound. Mm. That's at uh, Crescent. That's the next station west of the tunnels. The next station where anything stops. 
Th this is all strictly freight now, right? No passengers run over this line no, anymore? There are four passenger trains a day. Oh, really? Yeah, the Broadway Limited runs both ways and the Pennsylvanian runs both ways. Over these same tracks? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Oh, yeah. From Philadelphia to Pittsburgh. Same, same That route. might be a future uh, summer oh, it's excursion. Worth 90. You want to see the scenery as best you can see it out the side of a coach. There's no way to look out the rear end, I guess, but the scenery is still there, even though it's down to uh, two and three tracks. Yeah, I, I wonder. Well, there's a J1. We overtake that overtakes us later when we make a station stop. See how dusty and smoky yeah, it is. Yeah, oh yeah. The uh, visibility yeah. was terrible. This is approaching. Uh, this is there. Here it comes. This, uh, this is South Fork. The name of this place where we stopped. And yeah, this was a local that made quite a few stops train that came off years ago, but made a lot of stops, which was a, made an interesting ride. How long was the ride from Pittsburgh to Philadelphia? Uh, let's see, it's three, 344 miles, Pittsburgh to Philadelphia. So what's that give you, about six hours? Um, yeah, six. I forget. Well, this train, of course, made a lot of stops. Well, longer sure, than that. sure. I forgot now what time from about, eight, I don't know, it was eight hours or nine hours, yeah. something like that. Of course, if you wanted to do that now, You'd have to go to Penn Station and double back. Yeah, you, could, you yeah. couldn't take an Amtrak to, to Pittsburgh and then. Uh, oh yeah, sure. You can ride this in daylight. But yeah, I'm saying you have to go from Buffalo to Penn Station oh, yeah. to go to Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can't ride it down to. Uh, that's a, so stupid. Like those overhead water bridges. The Penn was the only railroad that ever used those. The Penn State invented them. You know, have uh, yeah, water pumps, gotta, uh, and you can take water there. from any, I don't know why they bothered with them having them right over a track pans, but I guess in case there was some engine that needed water, that switcher or something that didn't have a water scoop. Oops. That was really cold, that station. That was really nice. Now, is there more to this? But this other film, if you want to yeah, see yeah. this one, is going back to, uh, two days later, back east again, and there's some interesting shots. Now, now, wait you know, a second, you went, so you went from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh and then, then Pittsburgh back to Philadelphia? Then Philadelphia back to, to uh, Pittsburgh back to Philadelphia, yes. Why, so that you could take the train from Philadelphia back to Buffalo? Well, I wanted to go back to Philadelphia again, and I wanted to uh -huh. get movies. We get an entirely different view when you look east. Oh, uh, sure, uh, sure. Looking west. But the weather was so bad, I got just... Four minutes of film for the entire what, eight hour trip or whatever it was. I got four minutes out of the eight hours. The weather was so bad. It was so foggy. You get, well, you'll see in some of the scenes. Yeah. This, this little film. Okay, no, where were we? 84. Huh? Now, this is headed back uh, east again. But it was so bad around Pittsburgh, I didn't get any scenes that I wanted to get around there. It was east of Pittsburgh. It was just the weather foggy. was bad. It was just foggy. You couldn't see anything. And it started to clear up just a little bit here, but you can see how bad the visibility is. Is that, that uh... Yeah, no, that's... Uh, that wasn't the Glitzen Tunnel. No, that was the um, Radabaugh Tunnel, I think it was. Yeah. I don't know. I've forgotten how, when that was. Wow, yeah, I guess look it at was. how foggy it was because this is going down toward the horseshoe curve. Yeah, that was. Look at how foggy. Look at wow. Look at that fog. See why I couldn't pick that much of anything? You can hardly see the engines on the adjoining track. No, that's going up. That's just. This is just west of the horseshoe curve. You know, if this you didn't tell it. somebody that it was foggy, they'd swear you overexposed the film. Yeah. <laughs> you know? That's the way it actually looked. It just sure does. That's the way it actually looked when you were there looking back. Yeah, that's just coming off the horseshoe curve. There's that first signal bridge that's east of the curve. You couldn't even see the middle of the curve. And then they, they used to have water, water stand yeah. pipes there. I don't know why they didn't have a water bridge. Look at that. Yeah, isn't that great? This is coming down between the curve and um, Altoona. That's how it looked all the way. Four minutes of pictures in about an eight hour ride. Terrible. What a shame. This is getting closer to Harrisburg now, approaching that Rockville Bridge. There was nothing I could get in between there at all, nothing. We started to get a little bit better visibility as we got near Harrisburg. That's like, that would be like infuriating. You spent a whole year waiting for a trip. Yeah. Now this is coming onto the bridge right here. That track that turned off to the left goes into a Minola. Now there's a little smoke from the engine that's right. sitting there, but the rest of it is just haze. And, oh, the fog is cleared a little bit. Was it fog and rain or just fog? No, it wasn't. It didn't rain at all. Just fog. See, this is coming off oh, that's the, nice. the curved end of the bridge. You could just see a little bit of the bridge 
uh, the, off the rear of an eastbound train. You can swing around a curve there. You see the, you see the track going up to Williamsport and Buffalo. It goes off. Um, yeah, well, it goes off. Oh, right yeah, there it is. Tower. Yeah, That's Rockville Tower. It's still kind of foggy through here. The visibility is very poor. I didn't even get anything in Harrisburg. We're under the wire there now. This is uh, on that double where the two passenger tracks are separate from the freight tracks between uh, between Royalton and uh, Lancaster. It wasn't too bad right in here. The, off in the distance, it's hazy. Back in electrical power. Yeah. There's a huge one, yeah. That's it. That's the end, yeah. That's all I, all I got on the East Palm trip. That's too bad. We retired to oh, this is the one where you're pacing, right? Yeah. You yeah. know, tell me the story so behind this, this again. This How did this work out? How did you manage to do this? A friend of mine has been suggesting it for a long time. He's dead now, but he was a real railroad fan in you know, 607 and he loved 484s. That's These a Mohawk, right? Or Niagara? Niagara, they right. called them, the Central called them. And he'd been trying to get me to do this. And he's driving his car and I'm sitting in the back seat of his car working, running the camera out along Broadway. This is not very good, but it's the only place anywhere around Buffalo where you a road alongside the railroad. Right along Broadway, you got sure. all those trees along there and traffic going the other direction. That's the Empire State Express going out at 1.30 p.m. Oh, really? Yep. 1947, I think it is. It was still using uh, steam eastbound and diesel westbound. Just had to work out that way, the schedule on the diesels. Harrow was so clever that he synchronized the sound and put ho ho horns honking. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, they used horns most of the time. Those engines had whistles, but they generally used horns. You know, I have a two, I think it's two different recordings at Bayview. The one coming west at Bayview using the whistle, which is a real prize to have. Yeah, I'd love to hear That's it. That's as far as you could follow it. It's where Broadway turns away from the railroad. So we went up onto this Ellicott Road or something off Broadway and stopped. These, these scenes are at Wendy. That first one isn't very good. The hammer is too high for some reason. You're not on a tripod, are you? No. No, I never used a tripod except on an observation car trip. Track pans. It's re refilling after it. So what would it do? Water. The, the, the train would go by, scoop the water, and a pump would go on to refill it? Or would it well, be I don't refilling know. it all the, the time? Refilling by gravity out of a tank, I guess. I don't know. No, it'd be, it would uh, be. It couldn't refill all the time. It would be over, overflowing in a few minutes. Well, uh, yeah. It's thousands like of gallons of water going to waste. You know, that was a freight train on a passenger track. For some reason, east of Buffalo, or between Buffalo and Albany, the Central didn't have track pans on freight tracks, except at the one place, Rome. This is where so I thought down, you got soaked. Look at that one overflow. Oh, I was standing quite a distance away. I wasn't anywhere near. I'll show you the one where there were just a few drops on my pant leg, on the lower end of my pant leg. I swat, and I was standing on the other side of the track next to the... Uh, I still East don't Mountain think I found this area. Not the time you get rainbows from that spray. I have some scenes that show a rainbow on the, on the other side. So how would the engineer know to drop the scoop and how would he know when it was time to raise the scoop? They had mar marker lamps along the uh, markers along the uh, lights at the beginning and at the end. Right. And so the when engineer he passed would tell the, the fireman, the fireman worked the valve. The valve was at the front end of the tender, and the fireman would stand there with his hand on the, on the valve handle, and the engineer, on the uh, central, the engineer would yell down, and that meant to lower the scoop, and they'd yell up to, to raise it. On the pen seat, the engineer would give one blast on the whistle. Why couldn't you just say down? Way. I don't know. Pennsylvania. <laughs> Pennsylvania always did things differently from the New York Central. Yeah. It has an E6 Atlantic overflowing. This is at uh, Plainsboro, New Jersey, under the wires, electrified, under the Philadelphia, New York main line. It's a place where they kept track pans in because Jeez. they ran a lot of freight with steam. This is a 1946. 40, 40, uh, yeah, 46. Did you like the GG ones, John? Well, yes, sir. Electrics, I, I liked them. I certainly liked them better than some of the later stuff they had. They weren't usual, they were a famous, weren't they? They were a famous engine, and there was nothing that looked like them on any other railroad. 
See that glittering gold leaf? Oh, yeah. Sun and stripes? That wasn't paint. Yellow paint, that was gold leaf. Genuine. It was gold leaf? Genu genuine gold leaf made out of real 100% gold. Yeah. What was there's the reason? An L, there's an L one. I watched that one will overflow. See, they were running quite a bit of steam and freight then, even in 46 after the war. During the war, they really used a lot of steam. They didn't have enough electrics. Or, see, look at that. That's overflowing. Oh, That's yeah, look at that. Off. Here they had track pans in on all four tracks, even though it was electric. There's another E6 Atlantic, which is already quit scooping. See, it only come five miles, well not five, what is it, 15 miles out of Trenton. So they didn't need much water in only 15 miles, they hadn't used much. What was the length of the track pans? They varied from around 1,200 feet and they had some that were 2,600 feet long. Mm. Mostly around uh, 1,400 in most places. That's the Trailblazer, that reserve seat coach train from uh, New York to Chicago that they used to run. Did you ever did you ever hear stories of a fireman See that death? glittering gold oh, on the yeah. top of that? That's genuine gold leaf. What they do with the gold when they scrap the engines? Take it off? Yeah, it's too thin to, to, to save it. No, yeah, really. Went, went for scrap. Did or you the, ever hear of a, of a case where the where the fireman didn't lift the scoop? Oh no, yes, I've heard of cases like that. It would tear out the end of a. Oh, even though there was a ramp inside the the pan, sometimes it would still damage it or damage the water scoop. You know, there were times when they didn't raise it in time, or maybe it was stuck or something and didn't lift. That's east of uh, Lake Trobe, east of uh, Pittsburgh on the Pennsylvania main line. They'd probably tear up the roadbed, too. It could. There were times when the scoop dropped, I guess when it shouldn't, and uh, uh, in approaching a grade crossing, and they, I've heard of cases on the New York Central, like crossing plants are wedged right up, went right part way up the pipe in the scoop pipe up oh. into the tank. Can you imagine what that must sound like or feel yeah. like? You could even feel it in the first few cars on the train on the Central at 80 miles an hour when that water scoop would hit the water. You could just feel a slight bucking lurch. And lurch. Yeah, imagine you could still feel it at 80 miles an hour if you were in the first few cars on the train. You could feel it. You think it would tear that? I wonder what it sounded well, like. This, the this, there's an I one. That one will overflow. See that lamp right there? Yeah. That's where they have to raise the scoop there. You just about. He waited till he got to the lamp. Then of course there's a uh, several more feet. I don't know how much. A hundred feet or so of track pan left. So there's plenty of advance warning. <clears throat> that's in New Jersey. That one's not scooping water. That tape. Boy, that's on the Long Branch, New Jersey. Sometimes Was that a fancy invention? Water scooping. Oh, it was invented in England, actually. The oh, really? Pepsi was about the, the first railroad that used it over here. And the New York Central started about a year or so later. That's a Jersey Central. Jersey Central, yeah. Too. Jersey Central, this was in 47, I guess it was. 46 was there any provision in the track pan to, the, like that, to collect, recollect the water no. that was... No, it would just drain it away. It would be too dirty to use yeah. it anyway. It would be run down through the ballast and the industry. Now there's that one refilling. Every so many feet they refill maybe two or three places in the length of the... <clears throat> How deep was the pan? Well they varied. There. Some railroads they were six inches deep and some of the New York Central's were eight inches and some of the later ones that the Pensy installed were eight inches deep. But usually mm -hmm. they were about six. This is at Rawway, New Jersey on the Pensy main line. <coughs> there's a six track, or it was, a six track main line. The two middle tracks have track pans on them but they're no steam came through there when I was there for a while that afternoon. But there's an old uh, old P5 box cab uh, electric. And this is on the Jersey Central Main Line, west of Jersey City, near uh, Dunnellan, New Jersey. That was used by the B&O and uh, Reading Engines and the Jersey Central. This is a B&O. There's a B&O, one yep. of those P7 Pacifics. That's on the, the, uh, cap the Capital Limited connection. It was steam back then from uh, Jersey City to Washington, and then it was diesel from Washington to Chicago. And this is a uh, Jersey Central uh, Pacific scooping water. Was a tender specially made to scoop water, no. or, or, or did they all? No, well, they didn't all have water scoops. They had to have a water scoop installed. They had to have it installed, yeah. An internal pipe, as they called it. It was a rectangular shaped pipe that went up. So just the sheer the yeah, sheer yeah. pressure of the force, the speed, oh, is yeah, what the forced speed, the water up, oh, yeah, right? Any, I guess any speed above 25 or 30 miles an hour would be enough to Would force, force the, the water, water up, up into the tank. Yes. Sure. At higher speeds, it would go up into a terrific pressure. <coughs> that's on the reading, but you know, that's a B&O where they ran over the reading from 
bound Brooklyn, New Jersey to Philadelphia on their, their own lines, and that's uh, Reading. Uh, on, their, on a Reading electrified uh, line, it's electrified from Philadelphia to uh, West Trenton, four tracks. And they had track pans on uh, two middle tracks which were the passenger tracks. And that's a Reading uh, 282 on a troop train. Mm. They didn't scoop water because they didn't have uh, water scoops on any of their freight engines, only mm. passenger engines. That's the only place on the whole Reading they had track pans, although they used them at the... Uh, this is Wendy. Again, on the New York Central, a day that clouded up. It was a nice clear day when I left home and it got dark and cloudy. And Were you still on Meadow Road at the time? Uh, yes. Mm. Well, it's, yeah, yeah, I was lived there until 1969. Oh, look at this. Who's waving? No. That's, uh, that's the westbound um, Empire State Express, which was used diesels. Eastbound used steam and westbound they used um, diesels. That's the westbound. And it turned off <clears throat> So you got all cloudy. And some of these are a little overexposed. I opened the camera up too wide. And there's one of the Niagara, the 484. The best scenes I got are the third time I was there. The yeah. Time after the good, uh, good sunlight. And this is kind of poor. There's this bomb train. What if the boiler house is still there? I know you and I have talked about that before. Yeah, I don't know. I've never noticed whether it's still there. Now, this is on the uh, Pensy at Bellwood, east of Altoona. Well, it one over 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 that. Over. This happens to be on the... That's the place where I said they had them on only the two passenger tracks. Mm -hmm. And here's a K-4 scooping water right at the east. These I didn't um, splice in with the PRR stuff. I left them in here for some reason. Well, because it's all together. There, now this one, this one here, I think it's that one, I got a few drops on my pant leg. That's one of these. Wendy. That's at Wendy, yeah. So the third, this this is the third time that I was there. The you know, sun was shining that day. That's one of these trains westbound. I don't know. I think it was that previous one where there were a few drops of water. You got the only time you got wet. I couldn't wet. get any farther away. That drops down into some deep weeds and then there's a yep. ditch with water in it and I couldn't get any farther away. It's a good thing there wasn't anything going east on this first track. I really would have got soaked. Soaked. There was no place to get out of the way. But it was perfect for these westbounds because I was just out of the way of the water. The westbound trains on that second track. <clears throat> there it is. Pump it in. Refills from both sides down there. That some places they come in from directly from the bottoms. This I shot this because it was one of the freshly painted or new. Uh, Wow, freight diesel. Wow, that's ugly. And then <laughs> a whole string of brand new uh, hopper cars back when they used to paint them red. Here's one on that first track. I think that's the one, that was the one where I got a few drops of water. That's the one. Listen, well, so the camera got blasted for a minute there. It didn't, though. They don't see any water on the lens. Yeah. But I swung it around so as to... See, now, you couldn't get, I couldn't get any farther away. It was down in those weeds. It was all wet and muddy down in there. John, do you still have the camera? Uh, yeah. I'd like to know. see it someday. I'd, I'd like to see the camera. This is the one, uh, let's see, what, uh, yeah, this is the one. It was, in, it was in 46, I traded in my camera for a uh, magazine camera. There's a 484. Uh, see, there's a few drops. I probably, you know, rainbow. Yeah. I, I probably got a few drops on me there, too, because I couldn't get any farther away. Another uh, diesel. Boo. This is probably the Empire again. I wouldn't have bothered with it. Yeah, yeah, it's the Westbound Empire again. I'd forgotten to have two, but there's two different days that I shot that. Just to show that train, I guess, the famous train. Good thing you did. Yeah, yeah. And it's just looking into the west with this sunlight reflecting on the water. John, did you usually go on these photo shoots by yourself? Usually, yes. Yeah, except the time we followed the train along his friend was driving his car and he always wanted to try to get him movie shots going along there Broadway so we finally did it one day. But usually I was alone. I was on one of those, I forget which time that was that my, my sister went along with me, one of those three times at Wendy. He only went three at one, one time. I was alone the other two times. In this last segment of our visit, John wanted me to see the collection of films he had made at Horseshoe Curve, located about five miles west of Altoona, Pennsylvania. When the Pensy built the line through this area in 1854, 
the curve was considered an engineering masterpiece since it allowed the Pensy to reduce the westbound grade to the summit of the Allegheny Mountains. John spent so much time taking pictures, shooting movies, and making sound recordings at Horseshoe Curve that it almost seemed like he lived there. Back in John's day, many rail fans referred to Horseshoe Curve as Prophet's Park. The conversation between John and I begins with the two of us talking about the Horseshoe Curve film we were watching and how it was a copy of the original, which John had lent to Don Ball Jr. sometime in the mid-1980s. Don Ball Jr. was a railroad photographer and author, and up until his death in 1986, he was considered one of the foremost authors of railroad-related coffee table books, meaning a book made up primarily of full-size pictures with captions. Ball was working on a book entitled The Pennsylvania Railroad, 1940s to 1950s, and since John was still considered the authority on the Pennsylvania Railroad, even in the 1980s, with possibly the largest collections of photographs and films, Ball reached out to John to see if he would be willing to contribute some visual materials to what would be his newest book. John lent several slides and his original print of his Horseshoe Kerr film to Ball. Now, while it was relatively simple to make a copy of a slide for reprinting in a book, Ball wanted to make stills from individual frames of John's video, something John didn't think was going to work, and when he saw the outcome, he was less than pleased. It's at this point that our conversation turned a bit dark. You'll hear John change his mood a bit when he discusses what happened with Don Ball and the disgust at the fact the copy of his Horseshoe Curve film had faded red and was getting very soft. You'll hear John say that lending his original film to Ball was a mistake. When Don Ball Jr. died in 1986, John eventually had his slides returned to him, but the 16mm movie of Horseshoe Curve disappeared. Judging by how badly the copy was deteriorating, you can tell that John was very, very disappointed. Now, I'm not including this part of our conversation to discredit or cause any shame to Don Ball's legacy. I'm including it to bring to light a part of John's character that emerged later in his life. He had been approached so many times by people who wanted to have access to pieces of his incredible archives. I'm sure there were many times that borrowed materials were never returned to him. John was too shy and well-mannered to chase people down to demand they return his stuff. So the more he was asked to contribute to projects, the more he began to keep his door closed and his phone off the hook, metaphorically speaking. This is a copy, right? Yes. So you had this copy before you gave it to Don Ball? No, Don, um, Don Ball never had, never had this copy. He had the, he had the original, oh. which was a big mistake. No, it was copied before that. Before that, I had the copy before and should have given him a copy. <laughs> you have no idea who has this stuff, huh? No. no. The person who uh, supposedly had this stuff doesn't know anything about the movie film. Turn the slides. He did. Don borrowed some slides of mine, which he used. It turned out great in his book. And those got returned. Mm -hmm. At least they're salvage book. They were all removed from the uh, from the slide pane. Put them out of, out of the uh, slide uh, out of the cardboard mounts. Which book were they in? I've got one of his fancy, books. The fancy book. Oh. That he, uh, Forget the name. I've got his book, now. America's Colorful Railroads. Oh, yeah, no, that's various railroads. This one is 100% yeah. fancy, this book. That he put out. I think it was the last book before. You no, know, the last book before he died. He never, as I heard after, when he died, the book was being printed then, and he never saw a completed book. Mm. Died before it was finished, from the, before it came from the publisher. So that was his last book. You know, it's amazing how clear some of those slides showed up. Mm -hmm. Big pictures, the full width of the page. It's oh, yeah. How sharp they were just from uh, those photochrome slides, 35 millimeter slides. But it didn't work copying from movie film. It was just sort of fuzzy pictures and no sharp detail at all. This? This is fuzzy? 
Yeah, in Don Ball's book. Terribly fuzzy. Oh, and he copied from the... Copied, f- yeah. Oh, right, 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 yeah. Yeah, I don't know why. On a 35 millimeter slide, it turned out beautiful. And a movie... I don't know why it is. Some, oh, because he tell, probably had to still it. Somebody, t- somebody told me later that... And even though it looked sharp when you show the film on the screen, he said the, a- the actual frames of the movie film, even though you pick one that looks extremely sharp, when you blow it up that any size at all, you lose the sharpness that you don't realize it when you're viewing it in motion on a screen. Yeah. It can't be done successfully. Well, that was the only reason he had the movie film. Oh, it's to take pictures, pictures from still, his first book? And still pictures. He hoped it would work. For the book, pictures that I didn't have any slides for. But it didn't work. He used one or two in the, in the book, but it was either real fuzzy. And one or two right in the front, near the, inside the front cover or something. Near the front of the book. He reproduced them real small and they're still blurry. Well, at least we solved the problem with it being wound backwards. Yeah, it seems to be. Uh, the numbers are cor- correct. Yeah, now. They're yeah. not reversed, are they? Nope. So he must have got it okay. Did you do yeah. this? Yeah, it was just handwritten by pen, pen and ink, using yellow ink. Against the uh, black blue, uh, On blue cards, you never guessed that that was blue. That really lost its color. In the original film, that background was just as blue as can be. How did you fade in and out? I don't know. Is it fade? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, it dissolved. Oh, by moving the light away, I guess. Oh. You held a 40 watt bulb or something. Yeah. With a, yeah, look how red that is. That that original, it was just beautiful. The green of those trees, it's gorgeous. I can correct that with my camera, I bet. I bet you I can do a white balance on a blue card and make mm. that look just just perfect yeah, on video. Tape. All of these, the greens are just beautiful. This is the new improved Kodachrome film of 1939, and the greens are just exquisite. I wonder why the can't why the copy turned I out like know. this. Why the, I think this is fading. I think this looked better originally when I first uh, first got it some years ago. Really? I think it's changing color. Yeah. You know, we got to get it on videotape now. Then. I don't know. I've forgotten how this turned out. I thought it was better than this on on, on Heron's uh, videotape. I didn't think it looked this bad. Maybe. He well, can... see, he shot it with a video camera, John, so he probably did a color correction also. Could have. Yeah, it's possible. It's very it's possible. Better. It's better than this. I'd forgotten it. I didn't realize that this was as bad. Unless it is changing color. It's possible. Because this is quite a few years old now, this copy. I don't remember when. It was, oh, it must be 15 years. A long time ago, it was done by some photo laboratory, some film laboratory in Pittsburgh. Um, one of our members who lives uh, outside of Pittsburgh had it done. Mm-hmm. Yeah, just some um, Super 8 uh, copies, maybe, because that's what most people wanted. Super 8. Super 8. Right. And then he had this done in uh, negative, color negative of 16 millimeter. And this, this print is made from the color negative. Mm-hmm. But I thought it was better than this. Doesn't seem as sharp either, does it? No, no probably lost some sharpness. That smoke from the brakes was real blue in the original. Real bluish gray there, you can hardly see it, just sort of pink. Asbestos, smoke. right? Was that asbestos? Everything was pink. No, no, just uh, cast iron is all they used on brake shoes. 
Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Railroads never used any other stuff, so they would wear away in one trip. They yeah. Did. Even those cast iron shoes would, would wear out quite quickly on lines that had any grades on them at all or made frequent stops. You know, all brake shoes that. were cast oh. iron. They were cast iron so they would wear faster than the wheels, so that because they were cheaper to replace the brake shoes than to replace the wheels. Well, the wheels would be hardened steel and the uh, brake shoes were soft and iron. John, what did, did you did you shoot the film and then shoot the captions and then splice them in? Yeah, I spliced them in you know, some about uh, two, three years later, I guess, quite a long time later. Yeah, this film is terrible. Yeah, this is terrible. That's the best scene in the whole whole picture in the original film. Yeah, That's beautiful. Let, the let. freshly painted K four and beautiful green trees in the background. And yeah, maybe. Uh, gee, I hope I hope it's just because of the copy and not because the film is changing. Yeah. I haven't seen this, I haven't projected this in quite a long time, and I don't remember that it was this bad. I know it, was, it wasn't as good as the original, but I thought the greens were sort of a darker color. This is all pink. But John, a, isn't, that, isn't that what happens when a film starts going bad, it turns pink? Yes. That's yeah. what the first, the all Kodakon film of 1936 turned like this at first. In the first few years, it got like this, and then later in another 10, 15 years, it just faded right out, just to a pale pink. You couldn't even see any detail in the scenes at all. I only had a 50-foot uh, reel that I had shot, um, and no, no trains on it. It was just scenes around a yard and a flower garden and stuff like that. It was beautiful when it was first processed. Well, what? So this is only 15 later, years ago, you said? What? This is only 15 years ago that you had this copy made? Oh, somewhere around that, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. At least 15, I think. What do you think they used? I don't, I don't know. What would they, what would they use to make a, a, ne a negative? Got Some me. kind of negative film. I don't, know. I don't know what it is. I don't know whether the negative has uh, lost its color, whether it's just this print is poor quality. I have, I have that negative somewhere too. They gave it to me after they got done having copies made. Yeah. And I have that put away somewhere. I don't know. I haven't seen it recently, but it's got to be in that closet where I thought these films would be. Yeah, but these films weren't where you thought they were, no, were they? No, but the negative, I haven't used it at all. It was only used in Pittsburgh when they made it. Yeah. And these prints were made there, and I've never had any prints made from it. You know, this is a scene of this freshly painted K4 that was beautiful in the, in the original film. Of course, it isn't too bad of the engine because it's only the greens that have turned pink here. The engine looks fairly good. Yeah. But that was, See, that was can, newly, newly painted. I hope I can do something. And I wish I could have gotten a colored slide of that. What's that wire hanging there? Oh, I was standing too close. To, it's a pole or something. It had some kind of a wire that went up. Oh, oh, oh. A little, oh, a little oh. too close to it. Pole or signal bridge. I forget what it is. Look at that, double header. I wish I could have gotten scenes of some of those many triple headers that ran, but there weren't any that when, in 39 when I was there. Yeah, two M1s. Freshly painted express reefer there. Notice every engine has bells polished. Later years they were black. And all polished brass at that time. Now that's the shot right there that I first saw Pennsylvania Glory at Bob Shoe's place at oh, Cable yeah. Hobbies. Mm. When that and they were watching the tape for the very first time, and when that scene came on, they went nuts. Oh yeah, people do when they see that. They I went to show crazy when that was it. That's a T. Is that a T T one? Two T two T ones. A double header of T ones. Yeah, these are. These yeah, are, yeah I'm, you're right, John. Because I remember that shot, and on the videotape, it does not look that bad. No, not at all. Oh, no, that doesn't. The videotape that I've seen doesn't look good. There's a Q2, just making a test. It's coming down from a test run. There was a scene of it going up, but it isn't on this copy. There's a triple header, but they're not all K4s. There, were, there were, used to be a lot of trains with three engines on there. Now that's just L, to go around the curve, right? L1, M1, and a T1 on a Malin Express train. That probably has about 30 cars. 
you know, just for the 11 miles from Altoona to Galitzin. Then the T1 would handle that train the rest of the way to Pittsburgh. Yeah, this is really faded. Yeah. Oh, gee, I, I, I hope it's because of the copy and not because of uh, anything else. Is that it? That's it. I guess it is. Yeah. Please. <clears throat>